Well, it sure is getting cold out there, and with everything going on at Christmas, I got a question for you. Does anybody need some rest? Does anybody need some rest? Is anybody getting uh, kind of worn out? We've been shopping, been catching up with this and that, had a Christmas party, had this over there, and we are getting tired. You know, I heard about a store that was opened up in uh, Minneapolis. I think Minneapolis is home to the Mall of America, and I've never been there myself, but I've heard about other people who go there. I think they got roller coasters inside. They got all sorts of different things you can do. And one store that opened up a number of years ago is a store called, not Minneapolis, it's called Minneapolis. Minneapolis. And so you can go there, and you can go, and for 70 cents a minute, you can take a nap. You can take a nap. Some are quiet. They've got insulated rooms where you can go in. You can't hear noise from the outside. You can just take a nap in there. They've got some themes going on. So one room I think is like a tropical island theme. You can go in there. It sounds like the waves are crashing. Another one is a deep space theme. So uh, that actually sounds pretty horrifying to me. I wouldn't want to take a nap out in uh, deep space, uh, dark nothingness, uh, and all that. Uh, but here's the thing. Their website says this. Escape the pressures of the real world into the pleasures of an ideal one. Guests will want to listen to music, put their feet up, watch the water trickling in the beautiful stone waterfall, breathe in the positive filtered air, enjoy the full body massager, and just take an enjoyable escape from the fast-paced lifestyle. Anybody up for something like that right now? Yeah, I sure am. Now, uh, I do apologize. We don't have any massage chairs for you here this morning. And there will be no uh, naps taking place this morning. At least there's not supposed to be So uh, this morning. But uh, I was thinking about that myself. And I, sometimes I find myself like, you know what? Yeah, I do need some more rest. Yeah, I am feeling pretty worn out. Yeah, I think my body does need a little bit of a break. But even more than a physical rest, each one of us has an incredible need for spiritual rest. We need rest from the striving that so often we try to do as humans to try to earn God's approval. Now, you may have grown up in a context where uh, you felt like you had to work harder, try harder, do more, follow the rules, Achieve more holiness, and if you do all those things really well, then God will approve of you. Then God will welcome you and say, yes, I've got my thumbs up towards you. I approve of you. You can be close to me. But here's the thing. That's not the message of Christmas. That's not the message of the gospel. That's not the message of the Bible. The message of the Bible is not, hey, work really hard, and maybe God will be all right with you. The message of God's word is people found themselves separated from God and in order to be close with him there was nothing they could do on their own and they needed Jesus Christ to be given as a gift to redeem us to go to the cross in our place and by his blood we can be forgiven we can be close with God and as a result of that as a result of the good news of salvation that we have through the gospel we can find rest no, it's not 70 cents a minute. It doesn't even cost that much. It's a free gift of God. Today we're going to be talking about A Christmas Carol. We're going through a series, a four-week series, on uh, the Let Heaven and Nature Sing. Talking about some of the different carols that we sing and where they came from and where we find different parallels in God's Word. And today we find ourselves in the book of Jude. The book of Jude. So our message is called, God Rest Ye Mary." Gentlemen, Yes, the comma's in the right spot. It's gotten moved around over the years, but the idea is, God, rest ye merry, gentlemen. God, may God allow you to experience that rest, brothers and sisters. That's the idea there. And we're going to be in Jude 17 through 25. Now, here's the interesting thing about Jude. There's like only one chapter. So when you look at this, you may think, wow, we're going through nine chapters of Jude. The answer is no, it's just nine verses. So don't get too worried. But today, what we are going to see as we draw out from this second to last book of the Bible, we're going to see what it means that we get to have rest because of who Jesus Christ is, a gift that was given that very first Christmas. Let me pray for us, ask for God to speak to us in our time together. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much that even though we are a weary people, 
Lord, you give us rest. Lord, we turn to you. We recognize we can't do this on our own. We don't have the strength that we need. We don't have the wisdom that we need. We don't have the power and the holiness that we need. God, we need you to be at work within our lives. Today, as we read through these nine verses, I pray that you would encourage us. Help us to understand what it means that we can have salvation through your son, Jesus. And Lord, may we all not only understand what it means to find rest, but may we actually experience it. We love you, Lord. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Well, there are three things we're going to see within these nine verses. Three things we're able to see, different ways that we're able to experience the rest that's available to us. And if you've got your outline with you, I want you to go ahead and write this one down. Number one, we each should expect worldly people to tempt you to dismay. You should expect that there are going to be people or circumstances that come your way and want you to panic, want you to freak out, want you to give in to anxiety and fear and worry. And some of those people are people who know the Lord uh, and are not walking as they should. Some of those people, as we see in our passage today, are worldly people, people who don't know the Lord, but who are discouraging to us. You know, there's a movie that came out in 2009. It was based off a children's book that I remember reading as a kid, and it was called Where the Wild Things Are. Where the Wild Things Are. Anyone ever remembers that book or that movie? It's uh, quite very interesting imagery in there. Uh, so it's about a young little boy named Max, and uh, he's got a, an older sister and his mom, and he's got quite the imagination. But as he's spending time with his mom and his sister, he's feeling a little neglected feeling like he doesn't have the, the attention that he wants from them. And so he goes off and kind of, in this imaginative land, goes off and pretends like he's going where the wild things are. There are these big, hairy, look, scary-looking beasts, and at first, they're all kind of after him. But he uses uh, some of his skills and things like that and, and ends up, in the end, they all hail him as their king. And all these people who at one time were uh, scary, these kind of big monsters with big teeth and uh, hair everywhere, they actually they come to Max, their king, who they've crowned with a literal crown as, as their king, and they have a question for him because they experience difficulty in life as well. And the question that they have for this little boy named Max is this, will you keep out all the sadness? Will you keep out all the sadness? They're wondering, Max, as our king, as our leader, is there anything you can do to help shield us from the sadness? So Max, as uh, their leader, he lifts up what he has made, a, a makeshift shield. And he shows it to them, and he, here's what he says to them. I have a sadness shield that keeps out all the sadness, and it's big enough for all of us. Now, there are a few parallels that don't really work. But as we look at this, we have this boy who has been crowned the king. And these people who come to him and say, we need your help. Are you able to shield us from the sadness? In many ways, that's what Christ did when he came and was born those 2,000 years ago. When he was born and he came and he said, hey, I have the power to shield you from the sadness, from the brokenheartedness, from the things that happen within this world, those who uh, come and will attack you. And in the same way, each of us should recognize that we can turn to Jesus when there are temptations to dismay. I want to let you know a little bit about uh, the book of Jude before we get right into it. Uh, my daughter was surprised to hear this when I told her this week uh, that the book of Jude was written by Jesus' half-brother, Jesus' brother. And uh, they had uh, the same mom there. And uh, Jude was one of the followers of Jesus. He's mentioned in, uh, in Matthew and in Mark as one of the people who are following Jesus. He's listed there, by the way, as Judas, not Judas Iscariot. Okay, that guy didn't uh, last quite this long. But uh, this Jude is the one who went out and after he recognized who Jesus was, after Jesus went to the cross, was buried, rose again on the third day, and went out and showed himself to many of the disciples and then ascended into heaven. After that, Jude went out and was an itinerant missionary for probably about 30 years. So he's going around sharing the good news, telling people about his God and his brother 
who is the Savior of the world. So here you've got the brother of Jesus, who's also a seasoned missionary. He's been to lots of different places, helping encourage people to fight the Christian fight, walk the Christian walk. And here at the end of his time, he's writing a letter to believers to say, you can stand firm in the faith. You can contend for the faith. You can persevere until the end because God is holding tight onto you. I want to read for you the first verse for us today. Verse 17 is where we're going to pick it up. So verse 17 is where he says this. You must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now remember, some of the disciples were sent out, were commissioned as apostles, uh, men with a higher level of authority, being able to go out and minister. And these apostles had warned people, hey, you're going to encounter some difficult things. You're going to encounter some people, not only from the outside who are doing the wrong thing, but you're going to encounter people from within the church who end up being false teachers. And they're going to teach you a false gospel. I don't know if they were teaching uh, salvation by works. Hey, work really hard and then you'll be saved. Because that's not true. I don't know if they were teaching like a prosperity gospel. Hey, you should be, um, you should be experiencing health and wealth and everything. Otherwise, you're doing it wrong because that's not the case either as we see within the New Testament. But verse 18 continues, and when he says, In the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause the visions, worldly people, and here's how we know that there were not actually believers, devoid of the Spirit. These people who are there, who are teaching things contrary to what the Word of God says, were discouraging the other Christians, and they were causing problems. You know, maybe you're here today, and you've got people within your life who you could classify as worldly people or evildoers, people who are doing things the world's way instead of doing things God's way. And if you've got somebody in your life who's causing problems, I want to encourage you, don't dismay. Don't dismay. Maybe you've got uh, some people that you either you've encountered or that uh, you have uh, some level of sphere in your life who are doing things that are wrong, going out, doing lawless deeds, uh, uh, taking advantage of others because they've found an opportunity to do that. If you've encountered that, I want to encourage you, do not dismay. Maybe there's somebody in your family who's causing problems. Maybe you've got uh, your Christmas plans for this upcoming weekend. You already know which two relatives are going to be arguing at each other, whether it's about politics or decisions that were made or whatever it is. Do not be dismayed. Maybe it's just the world around you, people that you've encountered who are disregarding what God says. Do not be dismayed. Expect that to happen. That's part of the Christian life, part of the Christian faith. Because here's the thing. We see that God has his plan unfolding, right? Salva salvation history has unfolded before the eyes of mankind all throughout to the time of creation when God created the world. Sin entered the world. And God promised a Savior would come. And then they were waiting. And they were waiting. Finally, the Savior did come. And it was Jesus. And he did miracles. And he healed people. And he told them what it means to be a part of the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus went to the cross, to the grave, rose again, and now called all his disciples and the apostles to go out into all the world and make disciples. And that's where we find ourselves here in the church age. And the, the story's not finished yet. We're still waiting for the day when Christ will return, when he will make all things right. And as we're waiting for that day, we find ourselves here in the middle of God's plan. And that's one of the reasons that we find ourselves struggling at times because the story is not over yet. God is still at work. He has more to do, as I'll mention in just a moment. Now, as you hear me saying this, don't dismay. Expect that other people may tempt you to dismay. Uh, I want to let you know, you may have this question why? Why don't we have to dismay? There's really bad things happening within my life. Why is it that I don't have to dismay? And the reason is number two that I want to give to you today. Remember, Christ our Savior will defeat all evil. Remember that Christ our Savior will defeat all evil. 
You know, many of us have been watching, or, or some of us rather, have been watching uh, the World Cup. Anyone ever watch uh, one of the World Cup games this year? Okay, watch a little bit. We're not too good at watching the World Cup here in the United States, all right? We're good with the Super Bowl, but we maybe don't hit the World Cup uh, like we should. Well, here's a crazy thing. Uh, uh, from uh, All the way from uh, November, I believe it started, uh, November uh, 18th, I think, is when it started up. Uh, November 20th, all the way until today, the World Cup has been going on. And the World Cup has cost an estimated $220 billion to put on the World Cup. And why do we do this? We do this because many people in the world love football or soccer, and, uh, and also because we got to find out which country has the best soccer team, right? We're waiting to see. And actually, during our uh, 9 o'clock service, uh, I pulled it up and pulled up the score, and uh, I won't spoil it for you because I know some of you may have it recorded, but uh, I'm not even sure what's happened at this point. Some kind of some crazy stuff, so uh, you'll be able to watch that a little bit later. But we're waiting to see who is the champion. Is it France or is it Argentina? Who is a champion of the world in regards to soccer? We're waiting to hear. And for many of us, as we encounter evil in our world, we ask that same question. Who's going to triumph? Is God really going to overcome all the evil that's in our world? You don't have to watch the news for 30 seconds and you come across, why in the world would someone do something like that? Why are these things going on in our world that breaks our heart? And we wonder, God, are you going to come through? Are you going to be the one who is victorious over all these things? And even though I'm not quite sure uh, what this score means for the, uh, for the World Cup, the truth is that Jesus will overcome all things. At the moment when he died on the cross and rose from the grave, he sealed the fate of evil, and now we are waiting for the fullness of his plan to unfold as he returns and brings us home to be with him in heaven forever. Christ is the one who overcomes all evil. We actually see that in our verses today. Take a look with me at verse 20. It says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith, and praying in the Holy Spirit. He's saying, hey, this is what it looks like. In the meantime, while you're here in the middle of God's story, here's what it looks like for you to enjoy your relationship with God. Building yourselves up in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, keep, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. We're waiting for the fullness of all that he has planned to come through, for uh, his power and dominion to be shown uh, before all peoples to be the uh, thing that triumphs, and we're waiting for that to happen. And verse 22 continues, and it talks about the way we're supposed to interact with some of the different people we encounter. First, we got some people that we care about, but they're struggling with doubt. Verse 22 says, Have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. There are people we're going to encounter, and sometimes it's ourselves, there are people we're going to encounter who are struggling with doubt, wondering, is God really as good as he says he is? The Bible, the things that it tells us about how good Jesus is, can that really be possible? Can God really love me that deeply that he cares for me for all of eternity. There are those of us who will experience this doubt and the idea is that we should extend mercy to those people, encourage them with the truth of the gospel. And what does it say? Save others by snatching them out of the fire. All of us people, when we're born, we're in danger of the fires of God's judgment. But because of God's mercy, as we just heard in the last verse, the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ leads to eternal life. We're excited about that. That's great news. But there's another group of people who also needs our mercy, who needs us to act towards them, to show them the mercy that God has shown to us. The second half of verse 23 says, To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. There are people in our lives who are struggling with patterns of sin, who continue to fall and to fall again. And what this says is, hey, when you encounter those people, extend God's mercy to them. Don't be associated with uh, all the sin that they're a part of. No, be very fearful when you come close with some of those things, but absolutely love that person with the mercy of God. That's what it says. 
um, to others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. Sometimes in our lives, we feel like we're really struggling. But we need to remember that Christ our Savior will defeat all evil. It's just like, uh, just like the man who was walking past a little league baseball game. As he came up, it was small enough a game. They didn't have any numbers on the scoreboard. And so the man said to one of the boys who was sitting uh, in the, in the uh, bleachers there, or the, uh, the dugout, who was sitting there on the bench, he said, Young man, how's the game going? And the little boy said, Well, we're losing 18-0. to And uh, the man said, wow, that's uh, quite the point discrepancy. You don't seem to be nervous at all. Uh, What's going on, young man? He says, nervous? Why should I be nervous? We haven't even gotten up to bat yet. So the idea there was, the boy's like, no. Yeah, it feels like I'm losing right now, but I know that hope is coming. I know that we'll have a chance, and he had full confidence that things were going to turn around. You may be here today feeling like you're losing 18 to 0. You may look around at circumstances within your life and say, how is there any way that God is going to redeem this? But I want to encourage you, no matter how dark or discouraging things get, God will triumph over evil. The things that come into our world that we fight against, that keep us up at night, all those things will be triumphed over by Jesus in the end. Just like the author of God Rest Ye Merry Gentlemen writes, he writes, Fear not, then, said the angel. Let nothing you affright. This day is born a Savior of a pure virgin bright to free all those who trust in him from Satan's power and might. O tidings of comfort and joy. I'm not sure if I shared with you uh, from our first point, Uh, the part of our hymn or our Christmas carol that ties in with that first point. If you look back, our first point is expect worldly people to tempt you to dismay. But the author of our carol for today says, God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. Remember, Christ our Savior was born on Christmas Day. And why was he born on Christmas Day? To save us all from Satan's power when we were gone astray. O tidings of comfort and joy. So we can expect that there will be people around us who discourage us or tempt us to dismay, but don't give in. The reason why? It's because Christ our Savior will defeat all evil. He will overcome. But in the meantime... As we wait for Christ to return, as we wait for him to come back, to make all things right, to triumph over evil and show that uh, his victory was decisive at the cross, what do we do in the meantime? When there's discouragement, what do we do in the moments when we need rest? Well, the last couple verses of our passage tell us that we should sing praises to the God who deserves all glory. We should use our voices, use our hearts, use our our song to lift up praises of God and and worship Him for who He is. This last week I heard a story of a dad who was driving. He's from Canada, and he was driving, and a song came on that he couldn't help but get into a little bit. And it's the song, Everybody Dance Now. You guys all heard that one? Everybody dance now. Okay, we got some dancers in the crowd. I see somebody dancing. It's hard to say no to. My kids have put that one on, and you dance, and you're getting all over the place, and it's good. I'm going to stop myself right there. And um, the story of this man is that he was driving, and this song came on. He started singing at the top of his lungs. Now, I know that's a dangerous thing to do, because one time I was driving down the road. It was late at night. I was listening to one of my favorite songs, Valjean's Soliloquy from Les Miserables. And I had it cranked, and I was singing at the top of my lungs, and I guess it was affecting my gas pedal because I got a ticket. I was uh, speeding, and they pulled me over, and everything okay, sir? I'm like, yeah, I'm just uh, singing. That's it. Well, this man, he was driving down. He was singing, and he got pulled over as well. The officer's like, what's going on? Are you screaming? Sounds like you're really angry. He's like, no, I'm just singing a song, and he got a ticket, $118, and uh, he he couldn't help himself. He just had to sing. 
For many of us as believers, that's the way it should be. When we see the glory of God, I can't help it. You can dance a little bit, and we can sing a little bit. We can sing a lot. We can lift up our hands, praise God for what he has done, the goodness of his gift of Christ Jesus to us, the goodness of the fact that, behold, he is with us always, even to the end of the age, even as we wait for him to return. What good news it is that we're able to give him glory. So we close out our passage today with two verses from the very end, very appropriately titled, Doxology. Doxology, a moment of just singing praises to God. And think about this. Here, as Jude gets to the end of this, he's saying, hey guys, it's all right. It's all right. The end is coming. Jesus is going to come back. He will come and he will return. He's holding tight onto you. He's keeping you saved. Some of us, we think, oh, I got to hold on tight to God. I got to last, keep myself holding on until the end. Well, guess what? God's the one that's the one holding on to us. He's the one who reached out to save us to begin with. And he's the one who's holding on to us. And so here's Jude, Jesus' brother, his disciple, and his worshiper, who breaks out in song. And what does he say? Verse 24 is the first half of it. He says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. Amazing. He's the one who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. That's good news. God's holding on tight to you, believer. That's great. And the, the verse continues, and it says in verse 25, To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, he's the, here's the man, the God-man, whom Jude has been able to experience up close and personal for many years to see those miracles, to see his compassion, to see the work that God was doing through him, to see the fact that he went to the grave and rose again. He is excited to worship about him. He says, Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority before all time now and forever amen it's incredible he recognizes jesus the father the holy spirit is the one true god when it says glory it's talking about honor we give honor to jesus when it talks about majesty that's showing he is greater than all he is uh, the king over all things. When it says dominion, it means that his sovereign rule has no boundaries. His rule as a king extends to the farthest reaches of the universe and beyond. And not only that, but his authority. He rules over all creation. He is directly in control, caring for, intimately involved with every aspect of your life. And so we worship him before all time, now and forever amen 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 what an encouraging thing just like we hear the author of god rest ye merry gentlemen right before i tell you that last little thing uh i didn't tell you yet who wrote god rest ye merry gentlemen did i the reason for that is we're not quite sure actually if you look it up on google you'll see a nice video by pentatonics okay it's a great rendition i don't know how they make all those noises we're just doing acapella you can listen to that one on the way home god rest ye merry gentlemen but the author of this probably somewhere in uh, the 1650s right around then wrote this carol wrote this what it means to uh, to worship our savior to be able to experience rest when it says, God rest ye merry gentlemen, I think originally it was, God sit ye merry. And basically the idea is, hey, you can rest. You can sit down. You can be in a place of rest experiencing the joy of the Lord. You can chill a little bit because we know what God has done. He is following through. And so uh, the author of God rest ye merry gentlemen, whoever he or she was, writes this, now to the Lord sing praises. That's our call. Sing praises to God. Now to the Lord sing praises, all you within this place. And with true love and brotherhood, each other now embrace. This holy tide of Christmas, all other doth embrace, deface, sorry, O tidings of comfort and joy. Tidings of comfort and joy. So when discouragement comes your way and you're really tempted to dismay and to fear, 
I want to encourage you, don't give in to that temptation. Ask God to be at work within you, to fill you with the Holy Spirit and empower you to walk in obedience with confidence. God is in control. His dominion extends to all things. And when you feel like you're losing 18-0, to and you're feeling like, I'm way down, God, are you ever going to be able to turn this around? I want you to know we can trust because Jesus will make all things right. He will overcome all evil. And when you catch that glimpse of the glory of God, whether it's in the beauty of His creation, yesterday my girls were so excited they saw some snowflakes came down and they looked and they said, they actually have six points? They actually look like those pictures of snow that we see? I said, yeah, it's amazing, God's creation. As we see it in small things or in big things, the universe that God has created, give glory to the Lord. As we see God at work within our own life or in the lives of our family members, whether it's our children or our spouse or our parents, our loved ones, as we see God at work, give glory to God. Lift up your voices, worshiping Him, praising Him, because He's the one who gives us rest. Because of Jesus Christ, the one who was born that first Christmas, we can lift up our souls in worship. And each of us, gentlemen, ladies, boys and girls, we can experience true rest. Because Jesus saves all who turn to Him in faith. Amen? Amen. Let me pray for us.